thanks, Simon, for seeing us. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay, right, so, so would you like to ask the first question? Yeah, okay. So um, could you tell us a bit of, well, about yourself? Like, where did you study? What you did? Why? Uh, okay, what? actually, um, <laughs> I studied, all of my degrees actually were at the uh, UEA, the University of East Anglia. Oh, nice. Um, and I went there, I started actually, I went back to university when I was 30 or 31. And I had a bit of a break before that because I was in a band and that's a bit yeah, you don't want to know I, really. That's yeah. a, that's a, <laughs> there were rumours <laughs> running hidden, around yeah, of, of a that's band. A, that was the hidden history. So, <laughs> so, so I spent the 1990s pretty much touring in a band and then that I thought I, awesome. I, 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 need to, I need to get an actual career going. <laughs> That's not going to be the bills forever. So we went back to uh, the UEA University of East Anglia, and actually we all went back to the university, so we oh. keep the band going at the same time. Oh, um, <laughs> And I don't want to get too boring, so briefly I, I enrolled there for English studies, which was sort of part literature, part history, mm -hmm. um, and during that point I started to veer towards history. So it was, it was like taking, um, you know, studying literature, but at the same time sort of taking some contextual history modules. Oh. Uh, and actually I got hooked on the Tudor Rebellions. I think oh. I saw a sort of a... Um, an affinity between Tudor rebellions and punk music, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I sort of combined the <laughs> two. <Makes sense. laughs> ended up, uh, that's a bit glib, but not, not too yeah. much actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much the reality of it. Um, so I sort of I veered towards history and ended up doing the MA in history. Um, mm -hmm. Then I got offered a funded opportunity to do a PhD on popular memory, basically how oh, people right. remember the past and how they use the past in early modern England. Yeah. So, and right. then I did that and ended up here. Yeah, <laughs> so well, that kind of answers that, yeah. the next question. Why did you choose your specialty? I <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, yeah. It, it, well, um, it was something I was veering towards anyway, so as I say, I came from, uh, my undergraduate degree was more of a sort of a cultural history, cultural mm. theory approach, um, and I started to study this, you know, history, the, you know, the history of ordinary people, mm. is I wanted, and to get that, quite often you have to use theoretical approaches because the records yeah. aren't there directly, uh, and the PhD just seemed absolutely perfect because I hadn't actually thought in those senses, but actually the best way to think about that is how people remember the past, how they use the past, mm -hmm. um, how they negotiate their present day situation in that, and how they can oppose authority with these different, competing different definitions of, you know, how they got to where they were. So that's how I arrived at where I was. Great. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Band <laughs> included. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you've got everything here. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, can you tell us about any current research that you're doing? Yeah, at the moment I'm actually trying to move beyond, it was it, it basically it was a local study of the Forest of Dean, and I pretty much chose that because, hey, in a sense the records were really good for what I wanted to do, so it was almost quite self-selecting in a way, there were a series of self-defined riots, basically they they were very much framed in the idiom of popular shaming rituals, mm -hmm. so obviously drawing on the symbolism of protest and memory, um, that made a perfect study. So I wanted to, do, you know, and I, I used that really to... Um, try and understand, um, or to bring different perspectives to ideas of state formation, bigger cultural processes that were happening in the 16th and 17th century to say actually it was really different in this area. And it's an area which is very marginal, but at the same time it was very central in the fact that it was producing coal and iron, so in the 17th century it was very important. So in one way it was culturally peripheral, but actually it was economically, it was very central. So I studied that. Um, and I'm actually moving on to the moment, I want to understand um, the role of the law um, in moderating ideas of violence. So I'm looking at basically, um, to, to cut a long story short, really, people um, started to use the law in a sense, and almost unintentionally, I think, um, this becomes a vehicle for resolving conflicts which have been fought out with fisticuffs in mm. previous years. So I'm moving on to that, and I want to look at these sort of this new series of exchequer records that I'm identifying, and I want to do some sampling on other areas to see if the Forest of Dean compares with other areas. So I'm looking really, um, the main thing is people, like people like Norbert Elias, often mm -hmm. suggested that basically um, the idea that reducing violence is to do with you know an increased bureaucracy and a culturally sophisticated state and that kind of thing. And what I'm trying to do is suggest that actually people using the law themselves, actually, so, so, it, so it makes it more of a two-way process between the central states. Right. So it's, it's not just this civilising process that Elias yeah. suggests is rolled out. Mm -hmm. That I'm, I'm hoping to sort of look and find some records that suggest that actually people were going to these courts and themselves. To, to find you know a process of arbitration didn't involve violence. Yeah, that's the next three or four years. <laughs> that, that's the that's next three or four years planned out. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, can you tell us a bit more about what you actually do here in the uni? Because, well, I, I know you teach in the MA, 
but I personally don't know what undergraduate staff you yeah, do. Uh, yeah, as, or as, if you as have as any say, PhD students or anything I, I, like that. I, yeah, as I say, I teach on the MA, obviously, sort of the local history thing, and mm -hmm. part, of the, part of the mission there is to show people that local history isn't just specifically about a local mm -hmm. history, it's a methodology, so yeah. it's a micro history. That, that, that's one of the things that you know, I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I've done with the Forest of Dean there, it's you know, without context, it's just a study, and so yeah. what? So, basically, the point is actually to put that in a bigger context. Um, in terms of undergraduate modules, I've, yeah, I've, actually, I've got a really excellent PhD student who's just starting at the moment. Um, he's he's devouring the archives at a scary rate. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. So, 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 so that, that, that's excellent. That's all very positive. In terms of undergraduate modules, um, I've got um, currently teaching at the moment. I'm doing um, pre-industrial society and economy, which. I'm trying to rename so it's slightly more catchy. <laughs> Something like yeah. society, culture, and economy. Yeah, yeah it doesn't it's, doesn't really sound like the most. Uh, no, it doesn't sound beat. like it. The whole point is the cultural and social history, yeah. and it doesn't sound like no, it. So, no, yeah, really. I'm currently trying to rename that. Mark's being very supportive with that That's one good. as well. Um, and I'm also teaching um, a, a, a module that explores issues of gender. From oh, okay. um, I, I, it could go back. The course is written and designed to run from sort of late medieval, 13th, 14th mm -hmm. century. But actually, we pretty much start at the Reformation, so it goes through from yeah. the Reformation through to 1914. And the point is, probably it might sound more logical to take it through the 20s and 30s when women get the vote in England. Yeah. But that's another it, it, in terms terms of time constraints. Uh, and the whole point there is actually it's to it, it it's hopefully going to inform every other module that people take. It's one of those you know it, it, it's an option. Yeah. But the point is, most people that have taken it have suggested that it brings sort of new insights to all the other modules they're yeah. taking because you know it's it generally reflects everything. Yeah, you can you can it, apply it, that to any yeah, other yeah, thing. Yeah, you study. can apply it to everything. And we, we're sort of changing the name of that one as well at the moment because it was Women in History. Oh, yes. um, and the point is actually that we're looking at men as well because women's half. You can't understand women. Without and, uh, you can't understanding. understand gender ideology without understanding how the interaction between yeah. men and women. So that's actually going to be from um, January semester semester to it's going to be gender in history, 1550 to 1914. Um, just very brief, briefly, I've got two others. Um, my civilization study is Tudor and Stuart Britain, oh, yeah. um, Tudor and Stuart England, more correctly. Um, and I've got a comparative module about nation making. So basically comparing. Um, nation making from the 16th, 17th century in England to other states like German states and um, French states. Mm -hmm. Things like, you know, um, obviously centralised state formation, you know, top down from the monarch and that is a reformation, bishop princes, those sorts of things. But also things like culture, printing press and cheap print and worship and vernacular. The way, the way those, the way people come to understand themselves as part of a country as opposed to just a locality. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that yeah. explains that in gruelingly boring detail. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. Very thorough. <laughs> right, the, the next question is about yeah. something I am sort of aware you're doing. I don't know if Alex is. Um, yeah. um, you're doing a conference on crime and... Is it punishment? Uh, we, did, we did the yeah, conference or, or on you crime did and punishment. It already? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Because it, it seemed like a very exciting project. Yeah, it was, um, it, 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 it was really good. This is sort of one of my teaching interests from when I was at Leicester because I oh. held a, um, a, a, a teaching fellowship there when I was covering for Peter King, who does a lot of work on criminal justice reform in the 18th and 19th centuries. Oh. So um, the idea of the, you know, the move, <coughs> effectively, to be really, really glib about it, it's the reality behind Foucault's discipline and punish. Mm. So basically, the birth of the penitentiary um, the idea behind that, that whole lot of teaching was to you know, explain basically the different ideological impulses, once again to correct this idea that the state just rolled out a penitentiary system, that it was very uneven, um, lots of different <coughs> groups had interest in it. Um, and actually they wanted something a bit new for the Wessex conference mm -hmm. because quite often it focuses on Anglo-Saxon late medieval. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> quite a few people have done you know, crime and punishment in Anglo-Saxon Wessex. Mm -hmm. So we got a conference together with those papers. Uh, they work really well, and I was also actually very pleased to get Clive Emsley in on that. Who's, oh. um, you know, his books are pretty much the core text for anyone studying that period as well. So, um, I think it went really well. It was there. Yeah. There, there were a few grumbles about the fact that the coffee and tea were downstairs when they should have been <laughs> upstairs. But uh, apart from that, the day went well. I think people enjoyed it. Um, it was cold, but I couldn't control that. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's not, um, that's <laughs> not your fault, really. <laughs> no, no, that really wasn't my fault. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but apart from that, it was excellent, very productive. Yeah, good. Enjoyed that a lot, actually. Yeah. Good, excellent. Right, um, Alex, let's go with some of the questions you prepared. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any advice for history students or historians coming into your field? 
Um, well, the warnings. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> actually, well, well, actually, in terms of advice, I suppose, I suppose it's actually warnings, you know, it can be quite difficult to break through, obviously, mm. in that sense, you know, you have to, uh, the, the thing actually really is to think quite early on about where you're going to publish, um, and it, you have to start thinking about your CV sort of years in advance, because actually when you've got your PhD, when you're doing that kind of thing, then people expect you to be all dancing, all singing at the moment, so when you go for jobs, you know, yes, you have to. It's almost like um, when your dad told you to look after your CV in that sense, <laughs> making sure that you've been engaged in preparing. If you could organise conferences, those sorts of things, shows that you're very actively involved. Um, attend conferences whenever you can. Um, the IHR, actually, in London has an mm -hmm. excellent series of like history conferences and it caters for just about every um, interest you could possibly have, really. And so they're excellent places for networking. You don't know who you're going to bump into. Somebody who actually is going to be, you might be interviewing the next year or something like that. <laughs> That's never going to hurt. Um, as I say, think about where you're publishing. Um, think ahead of time about how that's going to look on your CV. And also you have to think about also the timing of publishing as well, because you've got things like, you know, you, you, you have an early career status for a while, which means that you are required to publish less. So if you publish earlier, that can probably, you have to be strategic to, to sum that yeah. up. Um, advice, um, choose something you like studying, because you spend hours and hours and hours and yes. hours in our class. And if it's something you don't enjoy, I've seen people, you know, yeah. that just completely lose interest and mm. just can't keep it going. So, I mean, if the fact that people historians are in the field that they're interested in, obviously anyway, so I don't think I could ever have had the application to do a maths PhD, for example. Yeah. I just don't think I could afford myself <laughs> to do that. I don't but know if anyone could. No, <laughs> I, I don't think so. That, that's the thing, but people obviously do. So, yeah. uh, so actually, the, the main advice really is to study something you enjoy, actually, and, and be really, really open-minded about mm -hmm. which approaches you're going to take, which sort mm -hmm. of theoretical approaches might help you. Um, which you know, w which conferences that you're going to go to? Because sometimes the most unexpected place you can get inspiration from most unexpected yeah. places. Yeah. So generally, be enthusiastic, be strategic, um, and choose something you enjoy really. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, what do you think, um, if at all, uh, that archaeology contributes to your field? Uh, I think it, it, there's a really, really long answer to this, but I guess you have yeah. a shorter answer. I suppose, actually, if we're dividing it between um, my field, I, you know, I like working with documents. Yeah. Um, I suppose probably the main thing, obviously it just provides a context. You can tell a lot from the material environment that people lived and worked in as well. But I suppose if I had to pick one particular thing, it would be possibly that it gives you an idea of history or the use of objects and landscape under mm -hmm. more normal circumstances. Because if you're using documents, generally, we're looking at people under moments of stress. You're yeah. in court for a reason, you know. You can, uh, you, you know, you, you can build a picture from documents mm -hmm. which might obscure thirty or forty years of normality. When you know, so say, if you, I work on customer memory. Mm -hmm. If you look, um, if you look at court records, you're only seeing it when it's being defended or when it's a point of crisis, that sort of thing. And I suppose archaeology, you can get get a sense of the structures and the sort of movements of people. Um, which on a, on, a, on a more normal level, it, yeah. if you know what I mean. So I think it complements it in that sense. You can sort of see, it gives you a, a more normalised context for the documents yeah. that we look yeah. at, I think, in Definitely. that sense. Yeah. Right, that That's still quite a long answer, actually, wasn't it? But no, <laughs> but, um, it, I mean, it, it makes yeah. sense. Some, you know, yeah. some historians have mixed feelings yeah. about archaeology. And it's oh, no, 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 no. I think it's, it's the, the most exciting point is when the material and the documentary tie up. Exactly. Yeah, so Definitely. when you've got yeah. documents and it ties up with an existing, you know, strictly archaeological, but buildings, material, culture, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the most exciting point. And I think they both offer different dimensions, you know, one without the other is, yeah. is part of the picture. Yeah, that's of course. Thing, really. yeah. Um, also, um, what other subjects, if any, have you used in your investigations, such as anthropology or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much... Uh, any, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a magpie with those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, memory studies is essential to what I use basically with my thesis and all the way through my work, really. Um, different kinds, you know, sort of um, from Durkheim through to Halbwach, um, mm -hmm. uh, the more modern sort of prota protagonist in that field. Um, anthropology, certainly, because I'm mm -hmm. dealing with all cultures in that sense. You, you, yeah, you, yeah. you can, you know, you can glean a lot of insights. Um, obviously there are precautions to that obviously you know you take them all at face value you, you, yeah. it's, <laughs> they're the problems of blending methodologies you know you, you don't want to contradict um, literary theory certainly um, in, it, it, 
as I, as I say, they're, they're, they're the main ones, I suppose. Um, a, a, a really big influence on me um, is like Gramscian cultural hegemony, that idea, mm -hmm. the idea that culture is, is, is a field of power. Okay, so the fact that you don't know, just to be an efficient state or an efficient source of power, you can't just coerce people into it. It basically depends on you know um, looting people hmm. through culture. That, that that that's actually been a really big influence on me. It's sort of I suppose you call it cultural Marxism, mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah, big fan of Gramsci. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, um, I think that kind of links in with in the next question, which is which one would you consider to be the main challenges of dealing with your primary sources? Or which ones do you think are the characteristics that makes them unique, or at least unique for you? <laughs> My primary sources. Yes, the yeah. ones that uh, we have to deal with. Yeah. I, I suppose once again, it's that 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 makes my sources unique to me. It's 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 we're back to that thing of trying to tie up documentary evidence mm -hmm. with the material environment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. especially if I'm trying to recover the experience of people that lived in a predominantly oral world, um, you know, uh, I suppose you're looking at court documents when that's them being brought into court to give testimony obviously it's not a normal situation but it's it, it's using quite often the court records of the exchequer court or the church court for example bringing lots and lots and lots of other peripheral information so say you're being asked about you know um, rogation of a particular year they mm -hmm. ask you about a date quite often the deponent or the witness will say oh yeah by the way that's the day we have our Michaelmas <laughs> feast and They'll bring all this other information in with it as well, mm -hmm. and you can get an idea of sort of. Um, I, I think almost reading against the grain with, yeah. with with those sorts of documents. So basically, they're there. They're, they're gathering testimony over a particular set of rights, but actually, at the same time, you get all of this co rich cultural information um, about the way they perceive their environment, um, and also you can tie that into you know sort of names on the landscape, place names, those sorts mm -hmm. of things, legends, folklore. Um, so, so I suppose actually, if I was looking, at, you know, what would make the documents that I use original, it would hopefully it would be the way that I read them to, to, yeah. to, to glean information um, that isn't actually explicitly in the text. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Okay, yeah. 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 Sorry, I, got the track. I mean, it's, <laughs> Sorry, it's always yeah. interesting how everyone yeah. perceives their own primary mm. sources because mm -hmm. not not always everyone has a chance to deal with something they particularly. Yeah. Find exciting, like yeah. you said earlier. Yeah, so exactly. And it can be the most unexpected places as yeah. well. As I say, mm -hmm. generally speaking, they're cases about reasonably dry sounding things, you know, the crazy rights, times, those sorts of things. But it's just when witnesses, they generally like to talk <laughs> in that period <laughs> and they like to be asked about their lives as well. So they quite often will, you know, you'll end up with pages and pages of this really rich material. Yeah. Well, ab about that, I wanted to ask you a particular question, which I totally forgot I had written, which was, um, what do you think about how oral history and local studies are treated by historians in general? And how do you think we are dealing with that in universities? Like, how are we getting yeah. that to our students? Because I, I didn't know about local history at all, really, until mm. we started on the MA. Like, we barely touched on it as undergraduates. And I found it a very interesting approach yeah. to how we do it's things. But it's not generally out there, is it? No, it's not. No, I think it's got. Um, I think people equate it with antiquarianism and almost like parochial studies. Yeah. The fact that, um, and the thing is, actually, if you if you do, you know, yes, you can do a study of anywhere. Yes, you mm -hmm. can, you know, um, produce a detailed account of one parish. But the the, the 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 crucial difference to me is whether you contextualise it or not. Basically, yeah. if you if you put that into a broader context and ask questions with it. So, mm -hmm. in fact, what you're saying really is that basically it's a microhistorical approach, and actually the way it's presented and the way it's viewed by mainstream academia, I think, quite often sidelines it yes. as a marginal, exactly. old-fashioned, parochial mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. And so, I think it's a big problem with it with it in in, in that sense. Um, in <sighs> I, th I think I try to explain it by if you look at the, you know the, the the way that those kinds of histories have actually completely revolutionised. That some of the biggest leaps forward in historiography have been through local studies, yeah. mm -hmm. studies of the industrial revolution, all those kinds of things. Basically, mm -hmm. you get rid of those big sweeping narratives by saying actually it's more complicated than that, and that's yes. how local studies do it. But I, th I think certainly, yeah, it, it does have a, the the ref doesn't really help either because it suggests there that it has to have a major international impact or mm -hmm. national impact. Um, but actually, if you interpret, if you read behind that, um, I think that any good local study should be able to have a wider impact anyway, in yeah. that sense. Mm -hmm. so, so strictly speaking, local studies on their own are viewed as a kind of sideline antiquarian mm -hmm. approach. 
but if they're promoted and if they're actually sort of presented and contextualised in the right way, they can be a completely exciting, cutting edge form of history. Um, and onto oral history, as you're saying, um, it's it, obviously technology has made that really exciting in the last yeah. 40, 50 exactly. years. Because you're looking for, you know, when I'm scratching around the 16th, 17th century, you're looking for anything you can, you know, any kind mm. of balance, phrases, landscape names, bits of pieces yeah. of uh, anecdotal stuff in evidence that I really, really like the sort of post war, the project things like the British Library running with these oral mm -hmm. archives, where you're just going in and just literally interviewing people on council estates about their experience, you're interviewing people in factories, you know, you, because that's actually rather than mediating that and doing a report and saying this is a study of female yeah. factory operatives in the 1960s, you're just recalling their voices. Mm -hmm. And then you leave the interpretation to anyone who wants to come along and do that. So I think that's a phenomenal. So to be a f historian in 200 years' time is going to be quite exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. we're a step behind. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so, so basically you can record all this stuff now. And then we've, we've, got, we've got the consciousness that we want to record all yeah. that information now as well. So as, as you say, we're building up. You know, hell of an archive there. Yeah, well. it. and, it, and, and it's an archive that's not mediated through historians. Mm -hmm. So it's just people are just speaking for themselves, exactly. literally just press the button and let yeah. them go. Mm -hmm. um, that's exciting, I think. Mm -hmm. Good. Right. Do um, you want to ask the next question? Or um, if you can understand my handwriting. Just about. <laughs> uh, that sort of links in with what you said there. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think is the future of history? And if there um, are any changes on methodology or approach that you think you would like to see happening or that you're sure we will get there eventually with the full technology or just the way yeah, things I, are changing? I, I, I suppose if you're thinking about um, how is, uh, I suppose basically digitization is going to be hmm. massive. So a lot of the records that we look at now are going to be online. It's already happening with lots of them, yeah. like the old project and things like that. to bring. So I suppose it's going to be more accessible. That, I think, will undermine... You know, particularly in England, the London-based focus of what, <laughs> mm -hmm. what it takes to be a brilliant university because you have to be close to the records. Yeah. If it's all online, I think it's going to democratise that. Is it, it, yeah, I think it's going to it's, it's going yeah, to massively democratise that. Um, also, in in, in t it, I suppose it'll make them more easily searchable. I mean, all, all, already the, the fact you can you know identify larger patterns at the click of a button rather mm. than trawling through the archives and counting yeah. them up. There's it. So almost like sort of mass analysis will be helped. Um, yeah. Distance will be less of a problem. Well, yeah. Research trips will be a lot less expensive in, in, in that sense as well. <laughs> yeah, well, which, 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 we're all going to breathe a sigh of relief about yeah. that. Um, but also, I think if we look to the future about how people are going to understand us, and it, I, I think there's going to be a completely different um, the kinds of records that are kept, because the kinds of records that we work on are pretty much left by serendipity. Mm -hmm. The ones yeah. that I know, they were in the Tower of London for 150 years and they mm -hmm. just survived. Um, but I think we are now selecting what records we leave, which yeah. I think is a really different way. So basically, I don't think people in the past, they might have wanted to choose the way they represent themselves, but to think of how you're going to represent yourself to future generations yeah. is something totally different. Because, the, you know, they they didn't think of it like that. They left yeah, the court records, left. and some of them survived, some of them got mold damaged, some of them were eaten by rats, some of them mm. were destroyed specifically for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But now there's so much information around that, you know, we're deciding what to delete and what to keep, and, you know, we're actively shaping the way that people will yeah. see us in the future, I think. Uh, and also, I suppose, uh, people think that these records are completely permanent, so we're digitising records. Yeah, but actually, that has a double-edged yeah, sword, isn't in, it? In a weird way, they're less permanent, because as yeah. you say, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're on... So is is the equivalent of paleographical skill in 200 years' time mm. going to be the ability to read Windows 98? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's going to be different skills mm -hmm. for historians yeah. and everything, and there's going to be a massive information to draw through as mm -hmm. well, in that sense, yeah. So that's that's my view on the future. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. good. Right, so that that brings us to the end. Um, is the time time machine questions the time uh, machine okay. question yeah, for yeah, everyone? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Um, but basically, if you would have a time machine and you could go anywhere, and, I don't know, use this information to write a book or do research on it. What, what moment in history or what event will you choose? Consider you cannot interact with it. Just like be an mm -hmm. expectator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, Ooh. It's difficult, I know. Yeah, it's it it's actually, years yeah. and years of history. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, yeah. you know. I'll be honest, I think this is going to sound really. Uh, I'd like to sit in the corner of a 16th century alehouse <laughs> <laughs> and hear about how they're speaking and how they're actually yeah. interacting. Like that, would, that would actually fascinate me, to be honest with you. 
I yeah. think that would be very interesting because it would be, mm. well, it would be so natural. Just yeah, that's what I mean. Just, yeah. Yeah, I'd rather, rather than going and seeing a big event or something yeah. like that, yeah, people I'd rather just literally that. sit in the corner of a 16th century pub or yeah. alehouse and, you know, all of the stuff that we read about, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. how is, it, is that actually is it true? going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, is it, yeah. how does it smell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How does it, say, how does it sound? How are people acting when they're drunk compared to when they're that, that sort of thing? Mm. It, 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 it just probably... I, I think ordinary life interests me more, and I think yeah. to, sit yeah. the, to sit in the corner of a tavern, I think, in the 16th or 17th, yeah. perhaps the 17th century maybe, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> people smell a bit better, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, that, that would be my use for time machine, I think. I think okay. that would be very, very interesting now that you mention it, just being there, mm. you know, even if yeah. it's just for an afternoon, you yeah, kind of will get a general idea of, yeah. well, yeah. what's... What's life like? It would actually be extraordinary, wouldn't it? Yeah. To sort of get behind the records because books and books and books have been written, once again, from court records, generally mm -hmm. speaking, mm -hmm. or things like that. But to actually just sit in a tavern and see how people go about coming in and how they go about their life, I think mm. that would that, that would be what I'd use a time machine for, I think. I think that's the most extravagant use of a time machine. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's very interesting. It's, yeah. Well, there you go. Okay. That's everything. Thank you very okay. much, Simon. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank right. you. It's been really interesting okay. to be. Thank you.